Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, thank you for attending this workshop. And uh, welcome to the second of our census workshops. Um, the presentations and the recording of the first workshop on May 20th is available on our PSRC census webpage. Uh, you can see the link to that uh, on the chat, in the chat box. Uh, before we begin this first session, just a few bits of housekeeping. Um, be sure to keep your mics muted at all times, uh, unless you're asking a question during the Q&A. Uh, there are two ways to pose a question to the presenters. You can use the chat button in the upper right corner of your screen. Any questions uh, will be passed on to the presenter during the Q&A. If you want to voice a question, press the raise hand icon in the lower right corner of the screen. Uh, you will be called on to ask your question during the Q&A. This workshop is being recorded. Uh, that recording, as well as the presentations, will be available on the PSRC Census webpage in a couple days. I will now turn things over to Heidi Crawford, a data dissemination specialist for our region, who will introduce the speakers. Heidi? Great. Thank you, Neil. Uh, and thank you to uh, the Puget Sound Regional Council for having the Census Bureau at today's session. We appreciate it. So I'm one of the few data dissemination specialists across the country that are available to conduct trainings and respond to data and queries from data users and other stakeholders. I also split my time working as a liaison for the Statistics in Schools program for the 2020 Census. And I've included both my information and our general line and email, which can be used to contact us. Our Census Academy is a site that provides some different options to receive training from the Census Bureau. You can find about upcoming webinars here. You can also look at past webinars to watch recordings and to get copies of the slides. We also have a series of what are called data gems, which are short one to three minute tutorial clips on different topics and tools. We also have several courses and are working on several more courses. All these resources are free and even feature speakers such as Tyson Weister, who you'll hear from later today on our data.census.gov topic. And the next slide, Neil. And then I wanted to just say a few words about our Statistics in Schools program, which is the other program that I help support. And this is a free program that provides lesson plans and other activities geared towards kids pre-K through 12th grade. And the lessons contain topics such as math and English, history, geography. We also have videos, games, fun facts, and coloring sheets that can be printed and downloaded. We created a whole suite of activities and lessons. These are activities that are geared towards um, diversity and learning about community. And in light of the pandemic, with more parents and caregivers helping with studies at home, we created a website that has home and distance learning resources. And we created a series of parent and caregiver toolkits. So I encourage you to check out these resources and share them with friends, family, and colleagues. Uh, it's a great way to get the kids still, you know, the census is ongoing. It's a great way to get the kids excited about the census, uh, but also hopefully it'll be a great way to help support parents and caregivers uh, in light of what is going on right now at home with uh, the pandemic and um, doing studies from home. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, who is Michael Hawes. And while Michael go, goes ahead and prepares uh, his slides, I'll go ahead and introduce Michael. So Michael is a senior advisor for data access and privacy at the Census Bureau. He is responsible for outreach and engagement with census, the Census Bureau's data users on issues relating to the impact of privacy protection methodologies 
on the accessibility and usability of census data. And prior to joining the Census Bureau, Michael served as the Director of Student Privacy at the U.S. Department of Education, where he was the department senior policy official responsible for the administration and enforcement of federal laws governing the privacy and confidentiality of education records. Michael currently serves as chair of the American Statistical Association's Committee on Professional Ethics. He is also a member of the Federal Committee on Statistical Methodology and chairs the FCSM's Confidentiality and Data Access Committee. So we're very lucky to have Michael today. I think this is a topic that a lot of people are interested in. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Michael. Thank you, Michael. Great, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay and can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me today, uh, albeit virtually. Um, so uh, with the 2020 census underway, we've been getting a lot of questions about differential privacy, uh, which is the new methodology that the Census Bureau will be using to protect privacy in our 2020 census data products. So today I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a brief overview of what differential privacy is, uh, to explain why we're adopting it for the 2020 census, and to provide some updates on our progress over the last several months on the implementation and improvement of our disclosure avoidance system. Uh, before I start, I just wanna thank my colleagues at the Census Bureau who've contributed information, uh, who've contributed to the information that I've included in this presentation. Uh, and to give the disclaimer that any opinions and viewpoints expressed today are entirely my own. So the Census Bureau's commitment to privacy and confidentiality is absolutely critical to our ability to produce high quality statistics about the nation's people and the nation's economy. Uh, and protecting the privacy of our respondents and the confidentiality of their data uh, is both a legal requirement and a core element of our institutional culture. All information that the Census Bureau collects or receives about our respondents is protected under Title 13, Section 9 of the United States Code. The Census Bureau employees are sworn for life to safeguard this information, uh, and the penalties for the unlawful disclosure of identifiable information can include fines of up to $250,000 and imprisonment for up to five years. But our commitment to safeguarding the public's data isn't just about complying with Title 13. Uh, it's essential to our uh, ability to ensure the completeness and accuracy of the statistics that we collect and, and publish. In an era of declining trust in government and of high profile data breaches that seem to occur with ever greater frequency, uh, maintaining the quality and accuracy of our statistics would not be possible unless our respondents trust us to, pro to properly safeguard the information that they provide. And when we publish our data products, we can't merely consider the privacy risks that exist today our legal and ethical obligation to protect respondent confidentiality requires us to make sure that our data products are also properly protected against the privacy threats of tomorrow. The challenge we face is that we collect all of this information in order to fulfill our, our mission to produce quality statistics about the nation. Uh, information that's tabulated from the decennial census um, is used for a wide array of purposes. Census data is used to apportion seats for the House of Representatives, to draw district boundaries for federal, state, and local elections, and to distribute over $675 billion each year. But census data are also routinely used for critical decision-making at all levels of government, and they enable policymakers, businesses, analysts, and researchers across the country to measure and to assess trends about who we are and where we're going as a society. And supporting these myriad data uses requires publishing an enormous amount of statistics and tables, often at very, very fine levels of granularity. Unfortunately, we know that every time you publish any statistic that's calculated from a confidential data source, you're gonna reveal or leak a tiny bit of private information in the process. In 2003, in what later became known as the Database Reconstruction Theorem, Denor and Nassim demonstrated that if you release too many statistics at too high a degree of accuracy, 
you will eventually reveal the entire underlying confidential data source. This challenge is even greater when you consider the privacy threats that we face today. They say that nothing on the internet ever goes away, and the same can be said for data once it's gone out into the wild. And over the past 20 or 30 years, we've seen a massive proliferation of data that could potentially be used to re-identify individuals in our statistical data products. Data about us are collected all the time by the companies we interact with, by data brokers, and through social media, not to mention the trove of personal information that's available on the dark web as a result of countless data breaches over the years. These data could all be used in an attempt to pick out specific individuals in the data that we publish. Meanwhile, technology has also improved. Computers can easily perform the complex matching algorithms necessary to leverage external data in order to re-identify individuals. And these parallel trends are not abstract concerns. They're, they represent real concrete threats to protecting confidentiality that need to be addressed. Over the past century, the Census Bureau has been a world leader in the design and implementation of statistical methods to safeguard privacy in public data releases. As new privacy threats have been identified over the years, the Census Bureau has worked diligently to improve our statistical safeguards to mitigate those threats. Our adoption of formal privacy for the 2020 Census is merely the latest step in a long history of innovation and continuous improvement in our privacy protections. And it's a necessary one to counter the 21st century privacy threats posed by that proliferation of external data and those increasingly powerful algorithms. There's a common misperception that aggregating data is sufficient to protect privacy. While that may have once been the case and may still be true for some limited data releases, it's not sufficient to protect privacy in large scale statistical data products. In fact, aggregate tabular data can often be thought of like a giant game of Sudoku, you know, a little Sudoku grid here. With Sudoku, if you have enough numbers pre-populated into the grid, then eventually there's one and only one solution to the puzzle. Well, the same holds true when you publish data tables. If you publish enough data tables, eventually there is one and only one set of individual level records that could have yielded those published tabular results. And while it might have seemed unthinkable a decade ago, computer algorithms can now perform these reconstructions of the individual level records from aggregate tabular data quite easily. So let's look at an example. Imagine that you collected some basic demographics about the seven people who live on a particular block. You then publish some aggregate descriptive statistics about those people. How many were female? How many were black? What's the median age of married individuals, etc.? Well, with those basic aggregate statistics, it's a trivial matter to solve for the only set of individual level records that could have yielded those results. I say trivial and I really mean it. In fact, it took a 2013 MacBook Pro a grand total of 0.2 seconds to reconstruct these individual level records. Our would-be attacker now has individual level records for everyone on the block, but can she actually re-identify them? Well, it turns out this is also a relatively trivial exercise. While the reconstructed records did not have individuals' names attached, they did have a number of pseudo-identifiers that can be used to link to outside data sources that do have names. In this particular example, the uh, attacker can use age and sex to match the reconstructed records to third-party data, say, for example, voter registration lists for that block. Now it's easy to attach a name to the records, and you've just learned Jane, Joe, and John's race and relationship status. And reconstruction and re-identification aren't just theoretical possibilities. There have been many notable cases of re-identification of supposedly de-identified data over the years. These are just a few. So with the risks of reconstruction and re-identification in mind, and the knowledge that these types of attacks are getting easier and easier as computers improve and external data about us increases, 
the Census Bureau decided to conduct an experiment to see how vulnerable the decennial census is to this type of attack. So remember a few minutes ago when I said that the database reconstruction theorem tells us that every release of a calculation or tabulation that's derived from confidential data leaks a tiny amount of private information. Well, the 2010 census collected a handful of attributes for the approximately 309 million people in the United States, giving us a total of 1.9 billion confidential data points that we had to protect. Yet, the 2010 census data products released over 150 billion aggregate statistics that were derived from those data. We wanted to see if that 150 billion statistics was enough to reconstruct the individual level records. The answer was an emphatic yes. In fact, using only a portion of the 2010 public data products, Census Bureau researchers were able to accurately reconstruct individual level data for all 6 million inhabited blocks in the United States. Moreover, we were able to reconstruct detailed individual level information, including sex, age to within one year, race and ethnicity for 71% of the entire population. And then linking those reconstructed records to commercially available data from the period, we were then able to confirm accurate re-identifications on all variables for 52 million individuals. It should go without saying that the results of these reconstruction and re-identification experiments were a real eye-opener for us. Recognizing the growing threats that I mentioned before, the Census Bureau realized that our traditional approaches to protecting privacy in our public data products are increasingly insufficient. So to meet our continuing obligation to safeguard responded information, the Census Bureau has committed to modernizing our approach to privacy protections and has adopted differential privacy for the 2020 census. Differential privacy, also known as formal privacy, is a framework for quantifying the precise amount of privacy risk for all calculations, tables, and data products that you're going to publish, no matter what third-party data is available to use in a re-identification attack now or at any point in the future. Said slightly differently, Formal privacy as an approach allows you to precisely measure and mitigate the leakage of private information in your published statistics. By quantifying that risk, that leakage, uh, known in the privacy literature as the sensitivity of the calculation or query, differential privacy allows us to mitigate that risk to an acceptable level by injecting precisely calibrated amounts of statistically neutral noise or uncertainty into the data. But what constitutes an acceptable level of privacy risk? Well, the only way to absolutely eliminate all risk of re-identification in our data products would be to never publish any usable data at all. Uh, clearly, as the nation's leading provider of quality statistics, that isn't a viable option for us. So policymakers must find the optimal balance wherein we're providing data that are sufficiently accurate for their intended uses, while also being sufficiently noisy to meet our legal and ethical obligations to safeguard the data. Finding this balance is ultimately a, a policy decision. That said, once you identify the point on the spectrum where the data are both accurate enough and sufficiently protected, that point becomes known as your privacy loss budget, and you'll often see this represented by the Greek letter epsilon. Much like a monetary budget, the lower your privacy loss budget, the less privacy you're willing to give up. Uh, an epsilon of zero would be the world of perfect privacy, but completely useless data. And an epsilon of infinity would be the world of perfect data, uh, but no privacy protections at all. Now, there are a lot of differential privacy naysayers out there who say that, that, that DP will destroy the usability of, of data compared to traditional privacy protection techniques. Let me be clear that when you're comparing differential privacy with traditional disclosure avoidance techniques, neither approach is inherently better than the other from the perspective of data accuracy. It all depends on their implementation and their parameters. I've seen some uses of differential privacy that result in highly accurate data, 
uh, when they are well designed and have sufficiently high privacy loss budgets. And I've seen some implementations of traditional techniques that resulted in terrible data quality when they're poorly designed or when they have particularly high swap rates or cell suppression thresholds. Where differential privacy and traditional methods do substantially differ is on the privacy front. Formal privacy pr provides quantifiable and future-proof guarantees that traditional me methods simply cannot. So what does all this mean for the 2020 decennial census? Well, for starters, let me be absolutely clear that the Census Bureau's adoption of formal privacy does not alter our constitutional mandate to apportion seats for the U.S. House of Representatives using the actual enumeration of state populations. The remaining data products, including the PL94-171 redistricting data, will have privacy protections applied as they have in prior censuses. Only this time, the noise that we're injecting will come from differential privacy rather than from the record swapping mechanism that we used in the past. The switch to differential privacy does require us to reevaluate the statistics and tables that we're going to be releasing as each statistic or, or table uses up a fraction of that privacy loss budget. So consequently, the proposed suite of 2020 census data products will be somewhat different than in prior decades. And if you want to learn more about these differences, there'll be a link at the end of my presentation, uh, or you can just search 2020 census data products on the census.gov website. So last fall, the Disclosure Avoidance System team's priorities were to scale up the system so that it would be able to run on a file the size of the 2020 census. We also needed to demonstrate that in doing so, we were able to effectively protect privacy at scale. Uh, and we needed to start the process of evaluating and optimizing the system for accuracy and what we call fitness for use uh, of the census data for major uses of, of the census. These initiatives were largely successful, but more work does need to be done over the remainder of 2020. And throughout these initiatives, the, the engagement and efforts of our data users have been enormously helpful to the identification and prioritization of the remaining work. In December of 2019, we partnered with the National Academy of Sciences Committee on National Statistics to host a workshop on our switch to differential privacy. At that workshop, data users from a wide array of disciplines and representing a diverse set of data use cases presented their analyses on a set of demonstration data that we produced a couple months earlier, where we ran 2010 census data through an interim version of our 2020 disclosure avoidance system. <clears throat> their findings helped us to identify where changes need to be made in the algorithm to ensure sufficient accuracy and fitness for use for the priority uses of decennial census data. So what did we learn? Well, the workshop participants' analyses confirmed what our own internal evaluations discovered, that the October vintage of our disclosure avoidance system fell short on ensuring fitness for use for a number of important use cases. In particular, there were notable amounts of error in population counts for political geographies and for American Indian and Alaska Native tribes, as well as some systemic biases in urban and rural populations and for housing statistics and vacancy rates. There were two sources of error in the demonstration data. Uh, the first is the differentially private noise that's injected into the data to protect privacy. Uh, this type of noise is statistically unbiased and is infinitely tunable through your selection of the privacy loss budget. The second source of error, however, comes from the post-processing that's done by the algorithm to convert the noisy data into the non-negative integer values that we're used to seeing in census data. In the demonstration data products, this post-processing error was substantially larger than the differentially private error. And unlike the statistically neutral noise of DP, the post-processing introduced those substantial distortions that the workshop participants identified. The good news in this is that the post-processing error can be addressed through changes and improvements to the algorithm's design without impacting the privacy guarantee. 
Interestingly, the post-processing error didn't really show up until we ran the demonstration data back in October. Earlier runs of the system on smaller sets of tabulations were much better behaved. Why? Well, apparently the disclosure avoidance system had some unanticipated difficulties processing the huge number of tabulations with zeros or very small counts in them. And the way the algorithm dealt with those noisy zeros introduced the distortions we ob observed in the workshop participants analyses. <clears throat> Excuse me. Fortunately, there are a number of ways to address this issue and we're already at work to correct for them. One of our top priorities in improving the disclosure avoidance system is to improve the accuracy of population totals for legal and political entities. This includes American Indian and Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian areas, minor civil divisions, incorporated places, and so on. Our goal is to ensure that population accuracy for these geographies are controlled by the privacy loss budget directly and not by those errors induced during the post-processing. We've also changed how the algorithm approaches the post-processing issue. Prior versions of the algorithm ran all of the post-processing at once, hence the trouble it had with those noisy zeros. <clears throat> Our new approach uh, runs the algorithm in stages, constraining each run to the values determined earlier. The first pass simply generates population totals all the way down to the block level. Then the second pass runs tabulations for the PL94171 redistricting data files constrained to those population totals from the first pass. The third pass then runs the roughly 3 million tabulations needed to support our population estimates program and most demographic uses of census data, constraining those values to the values determined in the first and second passes. And then the fourth and final pass uh, completes the remainder of our demographic and housing characteristics file uh, constrained to the tabulations from the first three passes. This approach enables us to, to substantially improve accuracy for those priority use cases uh, within the same privacy loss budget. So, so no change to the privacy guarantee, but substantially greater accuracy. But as they say, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, we don't want you to just take our word for the fact that we're resolving these issues. Uh, so we've developed a set of accuracy measures, accuracy metrics, based on the priority uses of census data and based on stakeholder feedback. These metrics allow us to regularly report out on the improvements we're making to the disclosure avoidance system, and they'll enable our data users to continue evaluating and informing the remaining work uh, that we're going to be done uh, doing to improve the system over the rest of the calendar year. These accuracy measures are available on our website. You can just search for 2020 Disclosure Avoidance System Updates uh, on census.gov. And we want these measures to be useful indicators uh, for our data users to observe and evaluate our progress towards ensuring that the 2020 census data products will be sufficiently accurate for their intended uses. The modernization of our disclosure avoidance methods for the 2020 decennial census has not been an easy undertaking, uh, but the growing vulnerabilities of traditional disclosure avoidance methods meant that we needed to adopt 21st century solutions to counter these new 21st century threats. The design and optimization of our disclosure avoidance system is still ongoing uh, and will continue over the remainder of the year. Uh, if you want to learn more about this initiative, or if you'd like to stay informed about design improvements to the algorithm, uh, you can check out our disclosure avoidance and the 2020 census page at the link here. And if you'd like to get under the hood of the algorithm, so to speak, um, you can find a link to our system's code on that page as well. And we'd love to hear from you if you have any suggestions for improvements. Um, and with that, I think we have plenty of time for questions. So uh, let me know what you'd like to discuss more fully. Thank you, Michael. So with that, I think we can take some questions in the chat or um, again, as Kristen had put in the chat, if you uh, want to raise your hand, 
And I'm going to stop screen sharing so that I can view the chat window as well, if that's okay. Oh, okay, sure. So while we wait to see if we've got some questions that'll come in through the chat or if there is a question that uh, folks would like to ask verbally, I'll, I have a question for you, Michael. I know that you do a number of these presentations. Um, you've sat on or you've presented for some of the state data centers and a lot of specialty groups. And what are the, the things, I guess, that you're hearing um, vocally from people about concerns about what's going on? So uh, this ties into um, the analyses that I mentioned from the um, Committee on National Statistics workshop back in December. Um, we heard a lot of concerns about data quality and accuracy in those demonstration data products that we released back in the fall. Um, most notably, um, there were uh, problems with uh, uh, housing occupancy rates um, which have, have largely been addressed. And there were systematic biases um, that the post-processing algorithm was, was introducing that were uh, effectively moving individuals from dense population groups to less dense groups or from, from urban centers to rural areas within a state. And so what we saw was this, this systematic upward bias in small populations and a corresponding systematic downward bias in large populations. Uh, and so that was that was one of the, the largest concerns that people voiced. And that was caused by those post-processing issues that I mentioned before. And so much of the work that we've been doing um, uh, throughout uh, 2020 so far, especially this spring, has been um, identifying and mitigating the aspects of the algorithm that were, were introducing those biases. And is there a timeline that you're working towards in terms of when everything needs to be settled? Um, sure. So um, as, as you probably know, um, with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, uh, oper there have been some operational delays uh, to the, the, the conduct of the 2020 Census. And the Census yes. Bureau has, re has requested um, uh, legislative uh, approval to delay publication of our data products until um, spring and summer of 2021. <clears throat> so with that in mind, um, our, our current kind of operational timeline for the disclosure avoidance system is we're continuing with algorithmic improvements uh, throughout the remainder of this year. Um, our data stewardship executive policy committee is currently slated to make uh, final decisions about major aspects of the algorithm's design and the list of what data elements will be held, what we call invariant or held exactly as enumerated uh, in September of 2020. And then uh, final decisions about setting the overall privacy loss budget for the 2020 census and for how that privacy loss budget will be allocated um, or spent, if you will, across the different data products, across levels of geography, across individual tables and tabulations. Those decisions will be made by DCEP in March of 2021. Okay. Uh, Kristen, have you seen anything? I haven't seen anything come through chat, have, or does anybody have any hands raised? I don't see any questions and no raised hands. Okay. Um, well, I think, you know, maybe one of the, the questions that we could ask uh, if people want to provide it in the chat is I'd be curious, uh, you know, we've got quite a few people on here. What are, you know, some of the data sets that, that they use or uh, have concerns about with what we're doing with our new approach? So if anybody would like to type type something in of some of the data sets that you use or have concerns about. Uh, 
So I see some answers coming in. Um, looks like maybe some place level data and census tracts. So can I, I'll, I'll ask a clarifying question to uh, uh, what Mary and Hyun um, uh, put in here. So uh, which data at the track level um, do you use most? Ah, ACS. Okay, so I can I can actually speak to that. So thanks, Michael. I was going to ask you too. <laughs> um, so everything I was talking about today um, relates to the privacy protections that we're applying to the decennial census, the 2020 decennial census. Um, now, the Census Bureau has committed to modernizing our privacy protections for all of our data collections, all of our censuses and surveys, uh, on a rolling basis. Uh, and that includes the American Community Survey. However, um, there are a lot of issues that would need to be resolved uh, before differential privacy could be used on uh, a, a survey that it, of, of the size and complexity of, of the ACS. So, and doing the, that would require extensive um, engagement with our data users to make sure that we're properly taking into consideration all of the different ways that they use ACS data uh, and the impacts that formal privacy might have on those uses so that we can optimize the perfect system to, to ensure fitness for use for those uses. So because there's a lot of, of stakeholder engagement that's gonna have to happen for that, and because our efforts right now are focused on getting the 2020 decennial census right, um, we have committed that the earliest that we would apply differential privacy to the ACS would be 2025. So a little ways out there then. Yeah, yeah, plenty of time. Mm -hmm. What about uh, decennial data sets? Are there any decennial data sets that people are looking forward to? Where the DP could impact those data sets? So block counts for population and housing. So this is one of the, the things that is trickiest because um, the, the real privacy challenge for the decennial census is the amount of statistics that we publish down to the block level because it's at the block level that individuals are most identifiable. Um, I, I don't have the exact statistic in front of me, but I, it's something to the effect of, um, Upwards of 50% of the U.S. population, um, their combination of age, sex, and block location make them unique. Uh, so when you have that many unique combinations of attributes at such a fine level of geography, it becomes very easy to link those records to uh, external data sources to attach names back to them. And then you've revealed um, sensitive information or personal information about those individuals, like their their race, their ethnicity, their relationship status. And so it's at the block level that protecting privacy is the most challenging. Uh, and so that's what our disclosure avoidance system is designed to address um, because it ensures that um, the more you aggregate up, if you build, um, geographies but using block data as you get larger aggregations of, indivi of individuals into these larger um, political or, or legal units like school districts or congressional districts etc um, your data will get more and more accurate uh, even though the block level data will have the most noise relative to the other geographic levels Yeah, thanks for explaining that, Michael. Oh, 
Okay, other, uh, any other questions? We'll give it a, another minute or so if somebody has another question they'd like to ask in the chat, or if you'd like to raise your hand and ask a question verbally. And for some of you on here, I did some of you know about this? And if you want to put this in the chat, were some of you aware of what we were doing on this topic, or did you learn something new today? Well, you're quite welcome, Mary. And uh, I'll also offer, if, uh, if you're like me and, and you, you come up with questions after the, the webinar is over, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to field additional questions um, uh, via email uh, or phone. Um, my contact information was on my slides and those will be shared with you. Um, so yeah, feel free to send those in. And also, Michael, we have, uh, we post periodically blogs also about this topic. Oh, that the the Research Matters blog that um, yes. yes, yes, exactly. So um, yeah, so roughly every month or so, uh, we publish a, a blog post uh, kind of updating our stakeholders on the recent development work of, of the DAS. Uh, we also just recently launched um, a, a Disclosure Avoidance System newsletter that you can sign up for via our website uh, and that we we post to uh, roughly every week or two um, with with um, kind of the latest updates and and information about about um, our efforts to ensure that the the 2020 data products are as accurate as possible. And also, I believe some of the sessions from um, uh, you know the different scientific groups or um, the one name is escaping me that we have sometimes quarterly with some of the groups where this is discussed is don't we, we have some of these videos also on YouTube that if people wanted to look at, uh, also other presentations that have been done on the topic. Exactly. So, so yeah, so the, um, the committee on national statistics workshop in December, all of those presentations by the various, um, stakeholder groups and data users, uh, have all been, were all recorded and have all been uh, posted online. Um, we have a great um, uh, YouTube video that we did in collaboration with Minute Physics uh, uh, explaining differential privacy and what it is, and you can access that from our webpage. Uh, we also regularly post our presentations to our advisory committees. Um, we've got working groups with our National Advisory Committee and our Scientific Advisory Committee, uh, so we post, we post our updates with them. Uh, and uh, yeah, as I said, like the 2020 Disclosure Avoidance System Updates page, uh, everything uh, that we're doing gets gets included there, and it's it's a great um, page to bookmark, so you can kind of periodically check what the latest news is. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for also sharing those other resources so that people have other resources to refer to. All right, well, with that, if um, let's just see, Mary, anybody a uh, show of hand at all for any verbal questions? Or Kristen, sorry, did I say Mary? <laughs> um, I don't see any hands raised. Okay. All right, and we don't see anything else in the chat. Uh, so with that, I guess we can um, thank, well, thank Michael for uh, joining us today. We really appreciate learning about this. I think you can tell from the comments that you shared um, some new things with people, so that's great. Great, well, thank you so much for having me with you today, and uh, I wish I could have been there in person, uh, but hopefully hopefully, next time you have one of these, I can, I can be there to, to actually interact directly with you all. And then uh, before we hop off, uh, Neil, you wanna share with, um, say a few words before our next session? Uh, no, I don't have anything right now. Okay, so uh, just so people know that um, our next session will be, uh, you, we, we're going to have a 10 minute break, you get a little bit longer. So the next session is going to be at 1020. 
uh, is when we'll start, and that'll be the data.census.gov session with Tyson Weister. So with that, you have a little bit of extra time to go ahead and uh, have a little stretch and get some coffee, and we'll see you back shortly. And thank you again, Michael. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day.